The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, The person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy in great ones. And the person who is dishonest in very small matters is also dishonest in great ones. If therefore you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? If you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Gospel of the Lord. We hear kind of a familiar phrase in the gospel today, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Uh, now, mammon is not a very common word in the English uh, vocabulary, at least we don't use it in our normal manner of speech. Many people sort of associate it with money, you cannot serve both God and money, but I was consulting the uh, commentary uh, this week, kind of checking a little bit on that word, and it was suggested that the word came from, a, in its origins, means anything that you put your trust in. So it could be money, but it could be many other things as well. You cannot serve both God and something else that you put your trust in. And the, and the point here that Jesus is making is, God is the one whom we should put our trust, in whom we should put our trust, only God. We put our trust in Him, everything else, uh, you know, is, is sort of, temporary and passing, but they cannot, cannot replace God. So that's the sense that Jesus is talking about here. You cannot serve both God, who you should put your entire trust in, and something else that might take its place. It's a kind of a form of idolatry. Now, I read the little, the shorter version of the gospel today. The, the longer version would include a story about Jesus praising somebody who was dishonest. Somebody who was dishonest. You say, well, that's kind of odd that Jesus would praise someone that's dishonest. So he's not really praising the dishonesty. What he was doing was praising the cleverness of the dishonest person and saying, in effect, notice how clever people can be when they want to be, when something's important to them. They can be very clever and they can use their talents and their gifts and their, their guile and they can do all kinds of things to get accomplished what they want to accomplish, even if it's something bad. And it's as if Jesus was saying, uh, how wonderful it would be if people would channel all the energy that they use perhaps for bad reasons and channel it for something good. You know, we've all, I think, had those same sentiments. Uh, how many people do we run into who, for example, have been scammed? You know, there's a, we live in a world of a lot of um, hackers, you know, uh, computer hackers. People get into bank accounts and they steal identities and they use credit cards and so on. And many times people will look at their statement and find a, a charge on their statement and uh, they'll call their credit card company and, and uh, it'll be a fraud. And, and we kind of wonder, boy, you know, these people are very clever. Some people are extremely clever in how they do these things. And yes, that's true. How, how too bad that they couldn't use that same cleverness and same skills in doing honest, honest work. So uh, that's basically the, the thrust of Jesus today. How, how um, Involved are we? How much work and energy do we put in building our spiritual lives as opposed to doing other things in our lives? You know, as we look at our Catholic faith, I think some, in some ways uh, we, we're a very big, big umbrella. The Catholic Church, we include so many people and so on. And in many ways, we, we don't ask uh, a lot, or extremely a lot of, of, of people who are members of the church. Uh, yes, we do have our certain church precepts, uh, Sunday uh, mass obligations and financial support and things of that nature and we have certain uh, sacramental preparations and ask certain uh, requirements before people receive sacraments and things like that but in general we don't ask a lot it's not like some other religions that perhaps ask more of their people of their constituents the mormons for example are very famous for having young people complete certain years of mission work 
It's not uncommon in the Mormon church that uh, young men would spend up to two years. It's not a mandatory, but it's highly encouraged. And thousands and thousands of 18 to 20 year old men in Mormon religion go out and actually spend time doing missionary work. And I was reading, checking that out. You know, who pays for that? It's not something that the church pays for. They pay for it themselves or their family helps them or they save money ahead of time and do that. So regardless of what you think of, of, of Mormonism, uh, that's kind of an admirable thing that, that there's people that committed willing to do that. In many other churches, particularly more, more evangelical churches, it's not, a, not uncommon that certain uh, stringent requirements would be put forth for their membership. Things like tithing. If you're not a tither of the church, then you can't belong. If you're not participating in their Bible studies or other activities that they put forth, then you can't belong. Now, those are things we typically don't do so much in the Catholic Church. We do, however, this year have been focusing a lot on the new evangelization. We perhaps have heard that phrase thrown out there through this year of faith that we've been celebrating in, in, around the world. New evangelization. Evangelization is just simply meaning renewing ourselves, renewing ourselves first and foremost ourselves in our relationship to Jesus. It's really kind of boils down to that. It's not anything too, too fancy here. The new evangelization, renewing ourselves, committing ourselves to, uh, to our re relationship with Jesus so that we can live our faith in a more vibrant way. That's really what the new evangelization is about. I was, uh, uh, happened to think this week of um, Matthew Kelly's, one of his latest books. I sometimes quote from Matthew Kelly. He's kind of a famous uh, popular, I should say a popular writer today on various themes, particularly on evangelization or, or the Catholic faith and how to revitalize the Catholic faith. And in one of his more recent books, he talks about the four signs of an engaged and dynamic Catholic. And he lists them as, as, as uh, these, these four, these fo uh, the four following signs. Number one, he says, um, a person of prayer, the first sign of a engaged dynamic Catholic as a person of prayer. Someone who, I'm, we're talking here more than just going to mass or an occasional prayer, you know, saying grace before meals or an occasional prayer when things aren't going well. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a person who has a routine. There's a prayer routine daily, somewhere built into their life. That's number one. Number two was someone who studies, someone who has at least some sort of, you know, regularity know, checks things out, you know, either reads a book or gets online and checks out certain uh, answers to certain questions that come. Someone who's doing some sort of systematic kind of review and study on the faith to kind of be more prepared to uh, answer questions that might come up in a, in a group somewhere. Number three would be someone who is a person who is engaged, engaged in the local parish level. Someone goes to church and uh, financially contributes to the support of the church and perhaps is involved in some liturgical role or a catechist or something of that nature. And the fourth thing that he listed was someone who is, um, evangelizes, not like a television evangelist or someone who stands in the street corner, but someone who's not uh, uncomfortable sharing their faith uh, if the circumstances arise at work or at home or among relatives or something of that nature. So those are the four things he mentioned, prayer, study, um, uh, participation, and evangelizing. And he did these surveys, he kind of went around the country and did a lot of surveying, and he kind of estimated, I don't know how he did this really, but he came up with the fact, that, or with his opinion, that there were about 7%, he said 7% of Catholics uh, sort of fit that, um, that, that profile, you might say. And he was simply asking the question, what would happen? Well, he said, first of all, imagine all the things that we're doing now as the Catholic Church in the United States. There's a lot of things that the Catholic Church does in terms of, you know, uh, feeding the poor. Many larger parishes have uh, outreaches to the poor, you know, feeding the hungry, uh, St. Vincent de Paul societies. We run schools, we run clinics, we run hospitals. Um, we do so many things, we build churches, we have catechetical programs, we have so many things we do now. And he's suggesting what would happen if that 7% went to 8% or maybe 10% or maybe uh, doubled and went to 14%. Imagine what could happen. Imagine the outpouring and the, the different things that could happen. If we're doing what we're doing now with perhaps maybe 7% who meet that, that uh, criteria, these four signs of the 
uh, engaged dynamic Catholic, what could we do if it went to 8 or 10 or 14 percent? So it's kind of something to think about, um, something to reflect a little bit about, but that's kind of what Jesus is trying to say, and I think in the Gospel today, is that, oh yes, we have, everybody gets committed to, to something in life. Everybody, almost everybody at least, has something that really gets them excited, gets them going, and they really get good at something. And he's trying to suggest how great it would be for the kingdom of God if we could utilize that kind of energy and effort in our spiritual, in our, our spiritual lives for our good and the good of all those around us.